Unrattled Inventiveness in Trouble from Abducting a General by Patrick Lee Fermer The news when it came through at last was bad. Lefteri had had a terrible time clambering about both chasms and cliffs. Not only had the garrison at Preveli been doubled, but a strong German contingent had been landed by sea presumably from Timbaki at Kerame, the very place from which I had hoped we might escape. There were still one or two beaches that might just be used, but there was a lot of coming and going of Germans all along the coast. It was very sinister. This activity in a region so remote and desolate, where they had never before set foot, coupled with the German sweep down the Amari Valley, looked ominous. Defteri had left a man down there to keep his eye on things and to send warnings of anything new. A tiny cove called Limni seemed the only likely place still left. Off went a runner to Dick with the sad tidings, and I sent Yanni Katsias to the west, to see what was happening at the Rodakino. Jack Smith Hughes, in charge of the Cretan section of Force 133, the SOE, in Cairo, must have been having an anxious time. It was only since we had regained contact that I fully realised how well we were being backed up. These goat folds and threshing floors seemed so remote from SOE headquarters at Rustam Buildings and the traffic of the Sharia Kassir El Ami. A runner from Dick suddenly arrived with an exciting and disturbing signal. George Jellico and a strong contingent of SPS raiding forces were landing at Limney Beach on the night of the 9th and the 10th with orders to contact us by hook or by crook. They were bringing their own wireless kit and would fight their way, if necessary, to organise the evacuation as soon as possible in collusion with me from some other beach. No signals were included in the message, so it looked as if they were landing blind in order not to jeopardise things by trying to combine this crash landing in Crete with the more delicate business of transporting and guarding the general. This was terrific. George Jellico was, and he still is, a resilient, unconventional and infectious compendium of energy, intelligence and humour. He was gifted with a great flair for attack and with unrattled inventiveness in trouble. Better still, he had raided Crete two years earlier, having landed with three French officers and a commando force. They had blown up a vast quantity of German planes and fuel, but, uniquely in Crete, a traitor had given them away to the Germans, and loss and capture had bedeviled their almost miraculous withdrawal. So he knew just how dangerous these things could be. Since then, he and his unit had been wreaking havoc behind enemy lines all over the place. I was just beginning to revel in the thought of this magical ending to our troubles when a message came from Lepteri Kalithonakis' man at the coast. Germans just moved into Limni. Keep away. George was due to arrive the next evening, so they must already be at sea. I dispatched a runner to Dick, urging him to bombard Cairo with warnings to be transmitted to the ship. If there were a breakdown, as there very often was, George and his boys would be landing in the middle of a reception committee. The only solution was to rejoin Billy and the General at once, to send them on 
further west with a strong escort in the hope of evacuation later, near Rodakino, and then to collect a dozen men with guns. Luckily there was no dearth of these, and dash down to the sea. Then, after dark, we could split into two parties and hang about in the rocks as close to the Germans as possible. When we heard the ship approaching, we could create a diversion in the opposite direction, which would either warn George and his raiders not to land, or, with a bit of luck and shouts across the water, guide them to a part of the shore from which the enemy had been lured. Then, before the Germans could realise what on earth was going on, we could all hair over the mountain, hide in a cave for the next day, and then, still at night, discreetly join the sedata western progress of the general. It is amazing how much confusion a few people can cause in the dark. Judging by George Shikundakis's reaction when I outlined the scheme to him, I foresaw great difficulty in getting anyone to remain with the general at all. Manoli wouldn't like it, nor would Billy, nor would the Antonis, nor would Grigori. George said we might draw lots for one person to stay with the general tomorrow night. This chap accompanied our moonlight march over the hills to Patsos. George's final solution was to put the general in a comfortable cave, then roll a huge boulder into the entrance for one night while we all streamed south to guide Olordos Tseklico and his amphibian thugs ashore. I need hardly say that this brief project came to nothing. The warning message got through all right, and just as Billy and I were busy arranging the details, a message arrived saying that the operation had been postponed for several days. Rodakino sounded like a likelier solution every moment. We would go west that night. Of course it was better so, but it was an anticlimax all the same.